As I said before, I am Pastor Dave. I'm the youth pastor here. Pastor Dennis is on vacation, so hopefully he has a uh, great time and a well-deserved vacation. He's a hard-working guy. So today's about service, and I wanted to keep with uh, Pastor Dennis's themes as we went through, and that's kind of a tough one, service, because when I walked into this church, I saw a lot of people serving. A couple weeks ago, we had the removal of all the Christmas stuff as we've uh, exited that season. It's funny because I look at it and I see about 40 people out there helping out, removing all this stuff. This morning, we had multiple people helping out with the sound booth, with getting everything together, with the coffee and all that stuff. We have a lot of people with a good heart for serving. Sometimes serving or the reasons behind serving are just important as how we serve or who we serve. Serving in humbleness really shows. Our Constitution, the way our government is set up, was even based off of these principles with the idea of leadership being service. When somebody's elected to Congress, the whole idea is somebody from the community, a well-respected person is elected to that position. They leave, they do their term of service, and then they come back to that same community that they left to stay part of the community. Not to be somebody elevated above there to rule like a king, but to help serve. I have a funny story about my brother-in-law, and I didn't tell him I was going to tell this story today, so hopefully, I'm, I'm sure he doesn't mind, but uh, he had a humble heart for service early on. He used to work at a guitar store called Motor Sea Guitars here in Waterford. Uh, no plug there. Uh, it's a really nice guitar store. A lot of um, artists and uh, people who are, are big celebrities, when they come through town, if they play, um, they stop by that store. Uh, the owner has been just fantastic to, to me, and, and it's a nice place to go. It's a family-owned business. My brother-in-law worked there. So one day he's sitting behind the counter and he sees this older gentleman walk in, guy with a kind of scruffy beard, normal dress, but he said the guy was walking around, kept looking behind his shoulders as he walked around the store. He thought, this guy's looking weird. I don't, I don't know, what is this guy doing? So he kind of watched the guy for a little bit and he started looking at some of the real expensive gear. And I saw him kind of looking at a couple of these $5,000 guitars and stuff like that. Oh, that's weird. Oh, okay, let's see what this guy's up to. And so he walked around and said, is this guy trying to steal something? Is he looking for somebody? This is kind of odd. So I finally walked up to the guy and said, hey, how you doing? Uh, is there anything I can help you find or anything like that? And looking around, the guy kind of startled a little bit. goes, oh, no, no, I just need to get a pack of strings. So he buys a pack of strings. He gives my brother-in-law a credit card. My brother-in-law rings, rings him up and he leaves. My brother-in-law thinks later on, he goes, I should have checked his ID. Maybe that was stolen or something. The guy was acting really funny. That was, that was weird. A couple weeks goes by. Guy comes back into the store. Same kind of demeanor as he's walking around the store. My brother-in-law sees him go back to the same section where the real expensive guitars are. So my brother-in-law thinks, okay, well, I'll see if he, if he needs anything. Let's talk to him and just chat him up. So he walks back there. Hey, how you doing? You know, I see you looking at these guitars. Is there anything you want to try? And he goes, you know, I've really been looking at that one. I like that one right there. So my brother-in-law hands him about a $5,000 Gibson guitar. Guy takes it over to the sand about a $5,000 amplifier, plugs it in, kind of noodles around for a while. He says after, you know, half an hour or so, he kind of gets done. He's looking at the guitar. He's looking at the amp. Okay. So he walks back over and Shane, my brother-in-law says, oh, what'd you think? You like it? And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he just expected him to hand him the guitar back. And instead the guy goes, you know, I think I'll take this guitar and I think I'll take that amp. And I need a couple other things too. So my brother-in-law goes and rings him up and being humble and nice, and still a little bit suspicious. He brings everything up and gives him a total which came to about $15,000 with everything in it. An expensive sale. So uh, my brother-in-law tells him the total and the guy gives him the same credit card. And uh, my brother-in-law, trying to be polite and nice, goes, you know, with this kind of bill, I got to see your, your uh, ID, sir, and I got to double check this stuff. So the gentleman gives him his ID, and this is the first time he looked down at the name. He looks down at the name and on there it says Robert Seeger. <laughs> Some of you young folks may not know who Bob Seeger is, uh, but a very famous musician. And, and my brother-in-law looks down at this guy's ID and goes, Robert Seeger, huh, wait, you're, you're Bob Seeger. <laughs> Apparently, Bob Seeger looks up and went, yeah, I thought so, that's why he kept helping me. <laughs> he said, no, I thought you were going to steal something. 
He was honest and humble about it, and turns out Bob Seger has quite the sense of humor and thought that was hilarious. Uh, yeah, so you never know who's around. You never know who you're uh, humbling yourself before. Uh, but we serve not just because it's the right thing to do, but because that's what Jesus showed us to do. Jesus didn't come as a man, as a poor person. Jesus had all the power on earth and in heaven. He could command all the armies of the angels. In Matthew 5.3, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Sometimes that gets confused with blessed is the poor-spirited. Big difference between those two things is that little differentiation. The poor in spirit, and there's an old Malaysian uh, proverb, and I got this from uh, Warren Wearsby's Bible commentary. I'm not a huge uh, studier of Malaysian proverbs, but it says, that whose ear is filled with grain rice leans the lowest. Meaning, if you have the ability to serve, you know, you take care of your own family, your own finances, your own life, it's easier to serve others. Jesus came here as the most powerful being ever to serve us, to get down on one knee and to wash our feet and to show us through examples how to live. So why do we serve and who do we serve? Well, number one, we serve our God. In Luke 16, 13, it says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Anything that you put ahead of God is a bad thing. We should put him first, family, and everything else afterwards. In 1 Timothy 6.10, it kind of echoes this. It says, but the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. 1 Timothy is a book written by Paul to Timothy. Timothy was the leader of the church in Ephesus. He was a young man and as a young guy, he had a lot to learn and about leadership and service in leadership. Paul, throughout the letter, gives him advice. One of the things throughout 1 Timothy 3, they talk about serving the widows and how there are certain people in that church that were putting themselves above everyone else. Certain women that would come in dressed so so much better than everybody else that would make the poor feel bad and they were doing this on purpose and Paul gives him some advice when giving make sure you're giving to those who are actually in need we don't want to give with blind eyes God doesn't want us to worship with blind eyes God wants us to worship him because we love him not because well I'm just going to do this God wants us to understand him and know him. He wants that relationship. And likewise, he wants us to serve and be the ones that serve others out of the knowledge that we're actually helping somebody who is in need. And Paul stresses that to Timothy to make sure you're serving correctly. Like I say, the reasons behind your service has to be important. We don't want to serve out of arrogance or because we want to get something out of it, but to help other people. We serve to be like God's example. In Matthew 20, verse 28, it reads, Just as the Son of God, or just as the Son of Man, excuse me, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life for the ransom for many. This is also echoed in Mark 10, 45. You know, when it comes to service, Jesus set an example for us and how to do it. We read that throughout Scripture, throughout his many things that he did. Not only were they fulfillment of the prophecy, but they were also examples for us to follow. God's nature, God's morals can be seen throughout Jesus' ministry, the three years that he was big in ministry. He was followed by not only the 12 disciples, but thousands. We hear about the 12 the most because they were set to be the leaders in the church following Jesus uh, returning back to the Father but they will also be an example to us as well. We serve to be an example to others just like those disciples. Now, interestingly enough, the word deacon in 
uh, Greek has a other meaning of server as well. So it's not just a leader, it's a leader in service. In John 12, 26, it says, Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor those who serves me. We don't serve to try to be honored. That's kind of a product of of that just with God. We want to be one with God. We want to show our obedience to what God teaches us. But God will honor those who serve him in places that they need to be. Has there ever been a time in your life, and this is a rhetorical question, you don't have to raise your hand, but has there ever been a time in your life where you felt down and out? You felt that you didn't have an option, and it may not have even been a critical incident in life, but it may have been something that just bothered you. It could have been a news story. It could have been a series of, of uh, uh, bad events. It could have been something that, you know, you just had a really rough day and you're really feeling down. Then someone does or says something just little and it just uplifts you. Something that you remember years later. It's weird how that works sometimes. Sometimes the little things are what gets you. I've noticed that little things in life really help. At my other job, a good friend of mine, uh, Tim, and again, didn't tell Tim I was going to tell this story, but <laughs> Tim had a, a, another person that we worked with that didn't get along with each other. This other person happened to be in a place of authority, just did not like him. There was something that happened, and they launched an investigation trying to figure out if there was really an error in what happened or not. This person that didn't like Tim specifically went out and sought to try to make it Tim, the one that was doing wrong, even though he may not have even been involved. So he sat a few other employees around and asked them, did Tim do something wrong? I happened to be there in this little meeting and Tim was not there to defend himself. And as this person went on and on and about thinking that Tim did something wrong, I remember saying, no, he didn't do that. I didn't see him do that, and I'm not going to just use Tim as an excuse to make myself look good. Somebody oversaw me seeing that and told Tim about it. This was back probably 12 years ago. Tim came to me and said, hey, thanks for sticking up for me. I appreciate that. No problem. Whatever, I was just being honest. Didn't, didn't try to make it a big deal or anything else. I totally forgot about it. Twelve years later, I'm sitting next to him and we're talking and somebody said something teasing me about something and he stuck up for me and it wasn't even a big deal. But I remember Tim going, ah, whatever he says is honest, trust me. And I said, why? He said, well, because he stuck up for me before. And I kind of looked over and I totally forgot about all this. He goes, do you remember that? And he, he recalled the incident. I honestly, no, I didn't remember that. I forgot all about that. That's 12 years ago, you know. He goes, you know, he goes, I never forgot it. It was something that made my career. He goes, this other person in authority wanted me out of here, and you stuck up for me. He goes, that, that takes courage. You know, I was just being honest, that's all. And that made him feel so much better. Just that little gesture was all it took. Sometimes what we do, sometimes our words, those little things that we do, make all the difference to somebody else. We serve to be with humanity to be united. And this is going to be a key verse. I'll let you guys flip to it in John 13, 1 through 16. Here we see Jesus. And this is just before the crucifixion. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own, who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Like I said, Jesus didn't come here 
with no power. Jesus had all the power in the world. He chose to serve us. He chose to give his life, to take our sins, so that way we can have salvation. So it says, He got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, Peter said, you shall never wash my feet. Excuse me. Uh, (laughs) Thank you. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you will have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just wash my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. The whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew that who was going to betray him. And that was why he said, Not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightfully so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord, your teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have for each and every one of you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than that of his master, nor is the master or is the messenger greater than the one who is with him. Jesus humbled himself not to try to get political gain, not to try to look special, look good, But he humbled himself to be an example in this time. Back then in in, uh, the ancient times, in the first century, they had cobblestone roads, they had dirt roads, and everybody would travel along these roads, including the colts, the donkeys, the animals going to and from the market. It got pretty dirty. So even if you washed yourself as you're walking through with open-toed shoes, it was very likely that your feet would become dirty very quickly. You didn't want to sit at a meal with these dirty, open-toed feet. So it wasn't uncommon to wash one's feet before a meal. However, it was uncommon, number one, for a master to wash everybody else's feet. It was uncommon for, a matter of fact, a Jew to wash another's feet. Oftentimes it would be a Gentile servant who would do this, if done at all by somebody else, if it wasn't the person who was doing it to themselves. He did this to be an example, to show you that he is humbling himself, even though he commands all the, the, the power of the world, he humbled himself to be an example to us, for us to follow. And he did it for the right reasons, not to show off, not to gain power. He already had it. You know, it's funny, watching some churches, they don't have the service that we have here. And that's why this sermon was so hard to put together, because I see so much great service, and I see so many people who love each other here. It's awesome. It really is. I went to one church uh, for a little bit, and there was always kind of a weird vibe there. You'd walk in, and and even though they'd have coffee and donuts and other stuff, the the people there just kind of didn't want to talk to each other or talk to you. You know, it just, you got this weird feeling. Um, Matter of fact, my sister-in-law decided to serve there and try to help out at one point, and she went in, and and, uh, in the morning, you had to show up real early to get the coffee together and everything else, kind of like Bob did today. Thank you, Bob. And during that time, the people that were serving would get in their own little cliques, and then they would talk about one another. It was really weird. And uh, she said, uh, as she tried, to, she tried to talk to everybody and introduce herself, and there were certain cliques that literally just looked at her and looked away. Didn't want anything to do with her. Because to them, serving meant trying to show off, trying to be the head person there, trying to be somebody special. It was a boost to their ego, not to try to help 
one another. They were doing it for the wrong reasons, and trust me, it showed. When I walked into that building, I could tell that there was just something kind of off. There was something kind of weird, and I'm not saying the person that ran that church was a bad person or anything else. There was people that were serving for the wrong reasons, and you could tell. So we don't want to serve to boost our ego. We don't want to serve uh, the wrong person. We want to help each other out, right? We want to uplift each other. We serve the brothers and the sisters of the way. Back in ancient times, when Jesus was here, and just after Jesus had ascended, before they called it Christianity, they called it the way. I don't know if you knew that or not, but that was before we called it Christianity. They were believers of the way. Sin is not freedom. God gives us freedom, and that's something very important, I think, is because we are free to make the decisions that we make. We might think being able to do whatever we want, and if we want to have a sinful life, that's freedom. It's not. Sin can be kind of likened to an addiction. If you know anybody who is addicted to serious drugs, you can see the negativity in their lives. It's sad. We see that drugs can lead to not only death, but it can also lead to serious psychological impairments. If you ever watch anybody who is addicted to things like heroin or pills, you see that their whole emotional state of being is different. You see that they have just a very different outlook on life, very weird views. Everything in their life is geared towards that addiction. It takes grasp of their whole being and pulls them away from where they're supposed to be. That's not freedom. It's a prison you're locking yourself into. And if you've ever seen somebody who's on drugs try to get off of drugs, especially cold turkey, there's a specific term out there on the street for that. They call it dope sick because it's one of the worst uh, flu-like symptoms you'll ever see. It's, it, they, they hate going through it. That's not freedom. That's a prison you're locking yourself into. In Galatians 5.13, it says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another with humility and love. When we serve each other, we show love. We uplift each other and show each other what we're supposed to do. In Luke 14, 8 through 10, it talks about humbleness and freedom. When somebody invites you to a wedding, do not take the place of honor. For a person who is more distinguished than you, may be invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that way when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, Move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of other guests. Right now in the world, we see Hollywood trying to glorify being popular, trying to glorify the love of money. And that's obviously talking about that verse earlier. It's not, money is not the root of all evil, the love of money, putting that above God is the root of all evil. They try to glorify a lot of things that are not godly today. It's sad. But we are not called to do this, to be popular, to be egotistical. We are called to be God's example to others because others are watching. I was watching a video not long ago of a guitarist and he was playing and showing different riffs, and he did a question-answer thing. He mentioned living in Texas, and somebody had asked him a question online and said, well, what about uh, uh, Texas? Isn't that a, a very uh, right-leaning state? And he said, yeah, it's a right-leaning state, but you know, uh, the only thing I don't like is those hypocritical Christians. Some people get this view that we're all just a bunch of hypocrites out there, and they're watching, and every now and then, they might get those seeds that are planted, those little things that show them that, no, that's not the case. 
No, are we perfect? Absolutely not. I'm certainly not perfect, 100%. You can ask my mom and dad who are sitting right over here. I'm sure they could tell you some fun stories about me being a young man. That being said, we try to show God's love through our service. We try to be humble, not because we have to be, but because we have the freedom to do that. And that kind of stuff will show to others. That kind of stuff will bring people to God. That's what we're called to do. That's what God commands. God wants us to serve, to show God's nature in us. We bear the image of God, and therefore, we should honor that. God wants us to serve, to be an example to others, like I just said. We want to uplift and to love those in need. Like I said earlier, we want to serve with eyes wide open. We don't want to enable people to do bad things. We want to try to bring them out of the bad things to God. God wants us to serve, to obey God's morals and his commands. It's funny, when I was doing this particular slide, I mistyped morals, and I put an E in there. So it said, to obey God's moralis. And then I was reading it, and I was uh, talking to my wife, Tanya, and I, I said, uh, to obey God's moralis. Who's moralis? Who are we supposed to be listening to here? <laughs> Just something silly that made me laugh. I don't know why. <laughs> but we, that's why reading Scripture is so important. God's commands are important. God's law is important. God's law does not save us, though. God's law is there to keep sin away from us, to keep us free, it's to keep us from that prison. God sent his son to save us. Jesus, he came here to earth to serve, to fulfill scripture, to fulfill prophecy, to take our sins, die on the cross, come back and then be resurrected and ascend to the right hand of the Father to be our advocate. That's what saves. The belief in that alone. If anybody here doesn't believe or wants to believe, you can say that simple prayer that, Lord, I love you. I believe that you came to this earth to take my sins. I give you my life, and you're saved. That's it. Yeah, obeying the law is great, and that'll keep those negative things away. That'll keep you from becoming that hypocrite that some people from outside see. That will keep you from doing bad things. That'll lock you in that prison, but Jesus is the only one that saves. That's why I love the fact that the cross is way up here. I've only been here six months, but I've seen churches now that don't even put the cross up front. I absolutely love having it up there because it's a constant reminder of his sacrifice for us and how much he loves us. Finally, God wants us to serve, to bring others to salvation, to open the door, to sow that seed. Little by little work. God needs us to work. And it's not always the same job for every single one of us. Sometimes you might be great at bringing people to salvation, but sometimes the person you're talking to, you might be too close to. And I've got a great example of one of my best friends. He's a great person. He's having a hard time struggling with God. And I'd love nothing more than to bring his faith up to where it needs to be because he's struggling with the, that final step. That final step of saying, God is my salvation, that Jesus came here for me. But I've known the guy for 20 years. Sometimes it's difficult for somebody that's that close to do that. But I keep sowing those seeds. I keep trying to convince him. I keep trying to put the truth in his ear. All those little details that he needs to hear. One of these days, maybe somebody will come into his life. Maybe God will bring the right servant out that just speaks something little, the little things. Maybe gives him that little taste, something that he needs to hear to push him over that edge. And maybe that's one of you, I don't know, but what I do know is constantly trying to follow that law and understand God, not because we are trying to do it for the wrong reasons, but because we want to love our God because God wants that relationship with us. Hopefully, this give you some, gives you some hints and some tips on how to serve. 
and serve others. I'm so thankful to be here, and, and I'll be honest with you, like I said, this was a tough one for me to put together because looking out and seeing everybody here and, and how much everybody here loves to serve, I, I don't want to say like, oh, you guys need to serve more because there's so many people here that serve so well and serve out of humility, and it's such an honor to be here. I want to thank you guys for being here today, especially trucking through the snow. Thank you so much. Let's bow our heads for a quick prayer. Lord, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you that your servants are out there, and even when we're in need, you send them to be with us. Lord, sometimes people call it guardian angels, but sometimes your guardian angels are just your disciples, your people that learn from you and want to be one with you. Help us guide people in the right directions. Help us say the right things. Put the Holy Spirit in our mouths so that we, we can speak your word and your truth to others to bring people to you. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. Help us be one with you now. Jesus' name we pray, amen.